Good morning, friends. works when I touch it. We'll try that again. <laughs> Lovely to see all of you here today, and we hope that you'll find something in this worship service that will give you some spiritual nurture for the week ahead. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, and we celebrate your presence. We would encourage you to take time to fill out the pew pad that's right at the end of your seat and you can put your name and information in there. If we don't have your address and phone number and email contact, we'd love it if you would be glad to share that with us. Then we can make sure that you're on our list to hear important things that are happening in the life of the church. And if you want to remain under the radar, that's okay too. Um, it's just nice for us to know that we can reach out and keep you informed of what's happening. We um, have a couple of good announcements now to keep you informed on what's happening. Ladies, oh, this is one of this. Yeah, try that one. I don't know what the problem is. Ah, low bat. Good morning. Freddie, low bat. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Burgess, and I have my meal ministry hat on this morning. Um, just a thank you to all of you guys who helped out yesterday. We served about 130 people, but we do have some leftovers. Um, and I'll be at the table with the red table cover. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brenda McDonald. And I'm here to just remind you that the purple cards you found on your pews this morning are for you to use to send a hello, a blessing, or a prayer to someone. If you address it and put it in the offering plate, we'll mail it for you. Or you can take it home and mail it yourself. And also, the other card that you may have found in your pew is just to remind you that your Stephen ministers are here and available for you. Thank you. And I'm here for the mission team. Uh, tomorrow is another opportunity to feed the poor at Bon Appetit. That's at Second uh, Congregational Church in Biddeford. It starts at 4.20 p.m. And you help serve and clean up. You don't have to make the meal. So if you would like to volunteer, please sign up under mission on the bulletin board in the atrium. Thank you. I would invite all who are able to please stand and join us in our responsive call to worship. We gather in this holy place, centered in the promises of God, caught in the web of grace, looking for strength to endure, welcomed into the house of blessings. We gather surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, lifted up by stories of faith, moved by challenging words and heartfelt prayers, desiring an outpouring of God's Spirit. We gather together in holy anticipation, 
and rejoice that God meets us here. Please join me now in our opening prayer of invocation. It's not working. We thank you, God, that in Jesus Christ you have built a house not made with hands, but a place in our hearts where you reside. We thank you that you have called us and that we belong to you. We come now longing to know the touch of your spirit that we may be strengthened and made whole. Come to us that we may recognize you, even in unlikely places, and be empowered to serve you in the world. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, amen.
Good morning. For me, this first reading answers the question, where is God when we argue? From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled and said to Moses, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us, our children and livestock with thirst? So the Lord, so Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. So the Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of some of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the people quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The lesson from the New Testament this morning is from Paul's letter to the church to the Hebrews. Paul says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. So he looked forward to a city that has foundations, whose architecture and builder was God. By faith, he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith 
without having received the promises. But from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind them, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Here end these readings from God's holy word, given that we might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. So one of my favorite posters says, life is a test. It is only a test. Had it been a real life, you would have been instructed where to go and what to do. Whenever I think of this poster, I think it's somewhere in the basement now, all dog-eared. I've never been able to let go of it. When I think of this humorous bit of wisdom, it reminds me to maybe not take life quite so seriously. I'm sure though there are all, we can all think of times when we felt like we were being tested. For some, this feeling might come during a time of transition, like moving to a new place or starting a new job. Or perhaps this sense of feeling tested results from some unexpected news of a difficult nature. Perhaps a death has occurred, or a loved one has discovered a major illness. Whatever the reason, when we encounter unknown elements that can result, we often feel like we're being tested. So this morning's Old Testament lesson presents just such a time of testing. The exodus out of Egypt and the long journey of the people through the promised land is certainly one of the greatest lessons in all of biblical history. Moses had acted on God's behalf to save the people from slavery under Pharaoh. But this act of God's redemption was only the beginning. They were a community on the move, leaving a life of slavery and torment and anticipating a wonderful, beautiful, new promised land. But it didn't take too long for the joy and the newness to wear off. As bad as life had been in Egypt, it was still familiar. The people knew what to expect, even though it wasn't great. It was still the only home they'd ever known, and leaving it was hard. Almost immediately, the people felt that God was testing them. When faith is stretched beyond what is familiar or expected, the response is often fear. For the Hebrew people, it took the form of murmuring which of course was a nice way to say complaining. No matter what the people had, they wanted something else. No matter what God did to fulfill their needs, it never seemed to be enough. The wilderness was a very real place of journeying and struggle, of testing and redemption. But this wilderness was not only a physical place, but also a state of mind. People were stuck between the wilderness of promise and the fulfillment. And it is at precisely this point that this story becomes a model for us. The time between times, often known as the interim, is exactly this type of journey. 
This church has been blessed with a history of wonderful, faithful, devoted pastors. And we know that even now, as the search committee does its good work, God is reaching out and planting a seed of wonder in the heart of a new minister. So we can feel that we have a sense of God's promise in our lives, but that we're stuck waiting and waiting for the fulfillment to come. In the biblical story, we get some clues. First off, it is God who directs the journey. It is God that initiates the move and leads the people through the wilderness. And while at times it seems to be a God-forsaken place, it is this place that over and over God reveals constant, consistent, loving care for the people. God provides water and food, laws, and leadership. These are not an abandoned people. They are the chosen people of God's own leading. But, as the text reveals, the people did not feel especially lucky as a result of their chosen status. In fact, they feel just the opposite. They're tired of being on the road, and they're fed up with the wilderness. They may have felt that God was testing them just to see how much they could endure, and their faith was growing weak. They murmured against Moses and God and even go so far as to threaten Moses and demand angrily, is the Lord among us or not? The people may have felt that they were being tested, but whether intentionally or not, their response puts God to the test. How do we respond in times of testing? Some rise to the challenge, almost welcoming a test where others would avoid it at all costs. Perhaps this comes from a linking of fear and testing, which often begins very early in life, even as early as we attempt our first steps. The response that we receive from our families as we attempt the many developmental tasks further determines the attitudes we'll have about trying new things. But it really takes a firm hold when we get to school and learn about grades. The longer one is in school, the more grades have a tendency to become the motivation for success or a source of anxiety. Instead of hungering for learning simply for the sake of knowledge and growth, the competitive nature of academics can become the driving factor. But testing does not end upon graduation. Soon employment becomes the next, next testing ground, and success or failure is frequently determined by profits and balance sheets, and not necessarily by the ethics or the integrity used to secure those profits. In the midst of all this, we may forget that times of testing that we experience are a natural part of the ebb and flow of life. And the attitude that we hold as we approach a time of testing will have significant impact on how we experience that time and what it is that we can learn. Will we be one of those who simply hold our breath and pray that the test will be over soon? You know, please, 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 just let it be over. But then there's another option. For Christians who choose the life of faith, we have a different call. In Paul's letter to the Hebrews, he states, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction 
of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then, of course, Paul goes on to detail all the examples that God has given the people over the years to prove that point. And we did not hear the whole chapter, but it's always good to remember that when Paul gets to preaching, as he does in this letter, you can't just pull out a couple of convenient verses to read without considering the whole. Paul builds to a point using a very thoughtful and intentional progression In this case, he's reminding the community of the saving acts that God has provided for them over many years. He starts with the example about Abraham and Sarah obeying God, and he continues to Moses' birth and then the Exodus event and God's leading the people out of slavery in Egypt. But he doesn't stop there. Paul reminds us that the acts of God for the Hebrew people were promises through faith, acts on behalf of the people are offered, but then they must take the next steps. I think that Paul is saying that if we can look at life and its many challenges as a series of tests, tests of faith, that we can begin to see each opportunity as a place for growth an opportunity to grow closer to God and stronger in faith. For we have the ultimate example, which is Jesus the Christ, who endured all for God's perfect plan. It's more than a chance for us to roll with the punches, so to speak. As we are bombarded by problems, responsibilities, or even what appear to be insurmountable challenges, when looked at as a test of faith, we always have the opportunity to succeed by growing closer to God. If, on the other hand, we view each new issue as a serious battle that has to be won in order to survive, we probably are in for a pretty rocky journey. The only time we're likely to be happy is when everything is working out just perfectly. And we know how often that happens. As an experiment, try this. Think of an issue that you're being forced to deal with. It could be anything. Perhaps you have a demanding boss or a difficult family member. No smiling in the back about having a difficult boss. Glen Ellen. (laughs) Sorry, I couldn't help it. Perhaps you have a demanding boss. Perhaps you have a difficult family member. If you can redefine these issues as an opportunity or as a test, then you can Think about how to solve those instead of a constant struggling through them. Perhaps you can learn something from it. Ask yourself, why is this issue in my life right now? The answer might not come immediately, but if you kind of think about that and hold that in your heart, rather than struggling, you may very well find that there is something that you can learn. What would it mean if I put God at the center of this problem in my life? Can I possibly look at it from a different angle? Can I see the problem as a test of faith? Now, the biblical example shows the people's response as angry and grumpy, and demanding. This attitude tests God. It is not the faithful response of God's people. God, however, does not punish the people in anger or in judgment. 
but God responds with one blessing after another and another. I do not believe that this is because God likes being put to the test, but because God knows that we will learn best through experience. The test can be a moment of opportunity. God knew what the people of Israel needed, and God knows what we need also. We have been given a wonderful and exciting journey to share together, and so we must continue day by day in faith. Now, of course, there will be moments of uncertainty. We might even feel like we're being tested yet again. But let us be reminded that courage is not the absence of fear, but the embracing of fear, even as we move ahead into the unknown. Courage is not the lack of fear, but the embracing and moving forward into the unknown. God's route to the promised land is not always quick. God's vision does not always coincide with the plans that we have made. But part of how we grow is by progressing from one faith lesson to the next. And part of how that happens, while we might consider it times of testing, can also be doorways of opportunity. The life of faith reminds us that God is loving us and walking with us through every phase of our journey. And no matter what funny posters I like to think about, having a sense of balance and a sense of humor certainly does help. But the truth, friends, is this. The life of, Christ the life of Christian faith is the real life. We have been given instructions on what to do and where to go. We are to love God, love each other, and love ourselves as we walk with faith and integrity. Yes, there will be times of testing, but this life is not a test. It is the real thing. And the blessings of God are with us as we grow in faith. Let us embrace and rejoice and be thankful for all of God's blessings and graces. Amen.
congregation may be seated. Friends, at this time in the service, we like to ask for you to lift up the names of those who you would encourage us to hold in prayer this day. They might be prayers of thanksgiving and celebration, or prayers for healing, or strength, or support for those who we know who are in need. We would like to continue to hold the family of Audrey Milne in our prayers Audrey's celebration of life happened here in the sanctuary on Friday, and her family was very um, pleased and grateful for all of the love and care from this congregation, and we continue to hold them in prayer in the difficult days ahead. Prayers that you would lift this day. Yes, here comes the mic. It, here comes the mic. I, I'm hoping that um, everyone in this congregation can please keep our entire country in its hearts and with all that happened in Charlottesville over the weekend and, and you know, so much hate and uh, I don't know, that's the, I, I don't, there's just so much. <laughs> anyway, so please keep my family and all the country in your hearts as we try to do the right thing and march against all this hatred. And we remember that in all things, God's love prevails, but it takes people of strong faith to stand up and stand for righteousness and justice. So thank you, we will pray, all of us, I'm sure, are praying every day. And let us also have hope and faith that that standing up will make a difference for good in the world. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. I was going to pray the same thing. Um, my other prayer is to Pilgrim Lodge. This is the week for Destination Hogwarts. And as you know, I am still in a lot of debt and money issues. So that's why I did not, I had to choose to stay back this year but I pray that they have a really good week and that the kids are going to have fun and that the weather will cooperate. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Vicki. <coughs> Excuse me. I have uh, two prayers of thanksgiving, one to you, to you guys. I don't know who ma made my name tag, but that means an awful lot to me. It may not mean a whole lot to you, but that says welcome. And two, I have a brother in Portland who's opened his heart to me. And I praise God, because he's the sweetest man that ever lived in my eyes. Well, thank you for sharing those blessings, Vicki. And you are welcome here, and you are part of this community and especially because you have your name tag. And that's a nice hint to everybody who has a name tag that doesn't necessarily want to wear them. It's a sign that you are loved and you are here. Thank you. Yes, Doug? Um, two prayers, one in celebration. Carol and I celebrated our 37th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. Congratulations, 37. And a prayer, and a prayer of healing and reconciliation for America that I know we've had a wild past in our country of civil unrest and civil obedience, disobedience, and war between the North and the South. But let's put that behind us and pull together as a nation of, of Christians and Muslims and Jewish people and Hebrews and Buddhists and be America, please. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Yes. Adria. Um, just a celebration for the little things that show you the good that is still in the world despite all of this hatred. This morning I was going to get breakfast and the person in front of me paid for my breakfast and it was just a nice little reminder that there are good people out there. You just have to be one of them. Thank you, Adria. Yes, Jane. Um, I'd just like to ask for prayers and blessings for those who struggle with 
mental health and addiction issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yes, John. We uh, read terrible things in the paper daily, the horrible pronouncements from our government, and we're talking about another situation, but something struck me this morning that is truly horrific. And it seems like uh, 30 babies and young children died in India because there was no oxygen and the hospital didn't pay the bill. 30 babies and young, it just struck me awfully. Prayers for them. Thank you, John. Yes, Ed. My prayers are for the 25 million people who are living in North Korea at this time and that they would be kept safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. <coughs> yes. Healing prayers for my son, Ernest, who is on his journey going to Wound Center. Thank you. Yes, Cheryl. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold. Um, I have a prayer of celebration, and it's not for applause to beat Carol and Doug, but my parents this year, week celebrated 49 years of marriage. And as fabulous as that is, the number, um, I just, my sisters and I, with so much hate and everything in this world and country, they've taught us marriage takes works and this compromise and this and that, and to stand up for what you believe in, and 49 years proves that <laughs> keep going at it and we can all make a difference. That's a beautiful example. Thank you. <clears throat> Congratulations. Yes, from the web community. From the web community, prayers from Carol Connolly, prayers of healing for her coworker Sandy, who was diagnosed with stage two cancer on Valentine's Day. And after going through several rounds of chemo, had a mastectomy this past Wednesday. Prayers of safe travels for Carol's brother Tripp, who is heading to his new home in Florida Tuesday morning, and safe travels to Freddie as he heads back to the West Coast on Tuesday evening. Um, and I think this time it's for real. <laughs> um, and also, in prayers of thanks and joy as Carol and I celebrate our 31st wedding anniversary on Thursday. Wonderful, congratulations. Lots of good joy. Friends, it's not lost on, on me, um, all the very difficult and, and wrong things that are happening around us, in our own country and abroad. There is no easy answer. Prayer does make a difference, but we have to do it day in and day out, all the time with that conviction of things unseen, knowing that in fact this is what we are called as Christians to do. And we are called to stand for what is right and what is just, following the example of Jesus, because that's what we say we do as Christians, that we're going to follow the example of Jesus. And that's a really hard thing to do. So sometimes when we don't know what else to do, to pray and pray and pray some more, and also for us to gather together as people of faith to support and encourage one another. Because when we try to deal with these things individually all by ourselves, it can get way too big for us. So part of the challenge is that we are called to stand up in faith for justice, and part of the joy and the opportunity is that we are called to stand up together through love for justice. We've got to be in this for the long haul, folks. There's no magic wand that's going to make it all better in a week or a month or even a year. But by our own example every day, for our families, for the people that we interact with, and by watching one another and having encouragement and support on how to do this, standing in faith. We do learn bit by bit. And sometimes when we're strong and someone else is weak, then we lift them up so that that same thing might be there for us on a day when we feel weak and overcome. 
let us persevere, knowing that there is a cloud of witnesses beyond us and before us that have shown us also how to walk this life of faith. Let us continue now with some silent prayer. Good and gracious God, we come to you now with humble hearts. We open ourselves to your love and your strength and your care so that we might give thanks and celebrate the joys that are within our midst the joys of devoted and committed relationship, where doing the work of love is a daily task. And after many days and weeks and months and years, people can come to a place of knowing each other even more fully, even as you fully know us, gracious God. So we give thanks and praise for the blessings that come with marriage and commitment and relationship. We give thanks and pray for those who we know who are in special need of prayer for healing, for strength. We pray for those who are experiencing issues of mental health challenges, the challenge of addiction, and we pray, gracious God, that we might have the courage to know how to stand with your love as our constant source, your spirit as the one that infuses us, following the example of Jesus the Christ who shows us how to live love through justice. And we pray, gracious God, that you would give us the courage to take one step day by day. Give us the courage to hear how you are calling us to respond. For some that may be to stand up in a public place For others, it may be to join in a circle with others to pray together. There are innumerable ways that we seek to follow the example of Christ. But when we are challenged in these ways in such a significant manner, gracious God, we also ask for the courage to stand and hold fast. when you call us to speak out, when you call us to step out, when you call us to work together, when you call us to deep prayer, when you call us to reach out and support one another, when we stand for those whose voice is very soft or not being heard, In all these ways, gracious God, you call us. And as followers, as people who strive to live in faith, this is the real life. And these tests that we see all around us are opportunities for us in each and every day to stand tall, as people of faith, to be compassionate, to be filled with grace, to call and work for justice, 
and to know and trust the gracious God, that it is in and through you that all things are possible. For those whose names have been lifted this day for special prayers, we lift them to your care, loving God. We pray that you would give us courage, not so that we might have no fear, but that we might stand fast in faith in spite of our fear. And we know that in all things, gracious God, you know what it is that we need, and in faith you will provide it. And we are honored to serve you, the risen one in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to have the opportunity to rejoice and give thanks for the ministry of music in our midst, we also have an opportunity to offer our gifts to God in this morning's offering. together in our prayer of dedication. Generous God, thank you for the blessings you bestow upon us daily. For every gift we have received, including the gift of faith, we give you thanks. Open our hearts in generosity and humility 
that we may be eager to share what we have and serve you in ways both large and small. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go forth this week, friends, may it be that the peace of God which passes all our human understanding will keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus Christ. Be the blessing of God who is creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Let us go in peace and work for peace. Amen. Amen.